So in another video we talked about examples of asexual reproduction and the opposite would be sexual reproduction and, and when you talk about that everybody thinks about you know mating and all of those things and cer certainly that is the most vivid image that people get but life is full of other examples of sexual production and complex mechanisms of doing so or doing genetic exchange and recombination which is basically what characterizes sexual reproduction so let's talk about some of these methods of sexual reproduction before we do that um, I also want to, to do a quick review of something that we're going to be talking about in more detail later in the year in a different lecture is it the idea that it is possible to create variation without sexual reproduction uh, the most obvious way to create variation is through mutations, uh, which are basically changes in the DNA sequence, which um, uh, causes changes in the chromosomal structure or the genetic structure, leading to birth defects or even alterations, which might even become adaptations. The reason why there are so many different kinds of animals and so many different kinds of life in the world is all because of basically mutations. Sexual reproduction only recombines what you already have but it's through mutations that the true variation will be introduced into the um, population. It's the difference between getting uh, different ingredients and making a different uh, um, a dish or getting a new ingredient to add to the dish. So um, the new ingredients can only come through mutations and that's the mutations is really what caused the evolutionary process. Um, re recombination and reassortment is more like a way to create variations which can in turn um, highlight certain mutations in, a, uh, in different conditions and that's pretty much what sexual reproduction is going to be doing now not, some some kinds of uh, genetic transfer or recombinations are not necessarily characterized as sexual production now in some texts they include these as reproductive cycles but I wouldn't necessarily mean they're not really reproductive cycles they're more like DNA exchange cycles so some examples of that are when viruses or bacteria plasmids enter another cell and integrate themselves within the DNA of that cell and cause the cell to replicate that DNA causing the duplication of the plasmid or the viruses so these are some examples of, of these of, of these methods uh, so transduction and also plasmid transference is a two examples of transformation of a bacteria through uh, transfer of DNA from either a virus or a plasmid. We're going to talk about that in more detail when we do virology and, and also microbiology later in the year. Um, another aspect is the virology itself with viruses replicating. Viruses are a very, very funny um, thing and a lot of discussion about whether or not they're alive, but one thing they definitely do is replicate themselves. But they don't do it by themselves. They have to use the machinery of the cell to do that. And they have two basic methods of doing that. One, they basically force the cell to replicate the, the, as soon as they come in, uh, and that's pretty much called the, the lytic cycle. And the other one, they incorporate themselves to the DNA of the cell, wait for the cell to split itself, and then after lots of splits have happened, then it activates, and instead of having one factory, it makes thousands of factories uh, which undergo the lytic cycle. So... Uh, in the second version, the virus is lays dormant for a while. And we're going to be doing this in more detail later on in the year when we go over these things again. But remember that the point of this is that there are other variations, other ways to create variation in genetic change, which are not technically repro sexual reproduction. All right? Now, another version of these things, which are kind of like a gray line, is a bacterial conjugation. Now, in bacterial conjugation, uh, bacteria um, use a pilus or pi a pili to connect themselves to another bacteria and drag the other bacteria to it. And then the cell membranes of each bacteria and the cell walls will create a will merge, forming an open an opening uh, between the two of them. And then across these openings, the plasmid DNA from one gets transferred into the other, and then that will cause the the uh, recipient cell to uh, change in response to that transference. So uh, that is what we were talking about in the previous, uh, uh, two seconds ago, about the plasmid transference. And that happens naturally, or it could also happen when uh, a little plasmid, whether or not it's inside of a, of a bacteria, is uh, accidentally incorporated within a bacterial uh, cell. Uh, 
and we can actually do that um, in the lab as well. So we can do force the transformation of a bacteria. In AP Biology, we actually make bacteria glow in the dark by using this method. Um, advanced um, um, unicellular life, such as our eukaryotic life, for example, here you see protozoa, also do a different version of this conjugation method. But this one, I would say it's more like true sexual reproduction. And then, but it's still... So it sounds more like an exchange than actual sexual reproduction, but it does involve mitosis and meiosis, so it is, but it's a, in very small scale. So what happens here is that the protozoa has two nucleuses. It has the macronucleus and the micronucleus. Now, the macronucleus is the one that controls normal cell activities, just like you and me. Then it has this smaller nucleus, which is involved in the replication and, 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 uh, and also in the... Uh, um, reproduction of the paramecium. So when the paramecium is getting ready to reproduce, it lines itself up with, a, with another one in an opening called the oral groove, which is also where it eats and also where it puts things in and out of the cell. It's kind of like a little phagocytic center of the cell. Now, they connect across this oral groove and fuse. But at the same time that fusion is happening, um, the macronucleus goes away and destabilizes, leaving only the micronucleus. And then the micronucleus undergoes meiosis and form four nuclei, just like you and me, except instead of forming four cells, it forms four nuclei within the major paramecium. Now, three of those nuclei will disintegrate, and one of them will be chosen to actually be combined with the nuclei from the other one. And after the nuclei from the other one happens, mitosis will take place to form four diploid uh, nuclei. Those nuclei swap around and switch places, and then the cells in diffuse, and one of the nuclei becomes the macronucleus, and one of the nuclei becomes the micronucleus, which means the macronucleus and the micronucleus might be different from each other. So it's, it's funny. The, the DNA that's actually exchanged might not be the DNA that actually is used throughout the life cycle of the cell. So it's a very complex life form, if you think about it, and the method that this works. Remember that... Since there was meiosis, there's going to be recombination, there's going to be a crossing over, and all the things we talked about in the other cycles. But when it comes time to decide, one of these is going to be that one is going to determine how the cell is going to look like and act, and the other one is going to be only used when the cell is going to reproduce again. But the genes which are in this reproductive one are not necessarily the same genes which are active on the actual active macronuclei, which is, which is funny because... Think about it this way, the reason why these cells survived is because of what's in the macronucleus, because it acts in, based on what is in the macronucleus. But then it passes on genes which are different from those. So it seems to be counterintuitive to evolutionary processes where you select against a gene that you have and is using. And, and so the phenotypes or the looks that these, these things show are not necessarily the looks they are selected for during the, the sexual reproduction process. So it's a very complex way to create variation, and it's happening in paramecium cells, and this is the first true example of, of uh, sexual reproduction. Now, the, uh, uh, there are other ways of doing this. Another way of doing it is called autosomy. Okay? Now, autosomy is a very funny uh, process in, in which the cells of paramecium actually kind of like have sex with it themselves. Now, basically, that macronucleus and the micronucleus both undergo uh, meiosis to form gametes. So, remember, the, these macronucleus and nucle macronucleus are different from each other, right? So, when they undergo meiosis, they, they become haploid things. And then, the, uh, all the micronuclei and the macronuclei, they disintegrate, leaving only one haploid micronuclei left. And then... That one selected, randomly selected uh, uh, haploid nuclei is going to undergo mitosis to form a, hap, a two haploid micronuclei. And then in something that's similar to partenogenesis that we talked about in plants, they, those haploid nuclei will fuse to form a diploid micronucleus, which then underco, undergoes two mitosis to form four diploid micronuclei. And then two of those will, for, will fuse and form one macronucleus and then two small micronuclei. And then after a series of replications, you're going to have different variations of the nucleus. So what's happening here, since you have two nucleus, two types of nucleus, 
it's technically sexual reproduction because you're mixing and combining different DNAs through the process. But when it's all said and done, you're not actually uh, combining different versions of the nucleus. You're actually selecting one and combining that one twice. So it's more similar to parthenogenesis than anything else, but it's kind of like um, it's kind of like uh, sexual reproduction because at the stage that you have these uh, one macronuclei and eight, eight micronuclei here, all right. At this stage, the uh, there, there's going to be a lot of may, uh, crossing over and things like that happening between the nuclei, which is going to create variation. So it's technically causing a parallel exchange, which classify, qualifies as sexual exchange. All right. Now, notice also that the the micronuclei will fuse into the macronuclei, which will change it. And that's where the actual sexual production is actually happening. The, the combination of the, of the different types of nucleuses and therefore uh, creating a new version of that nucleus. All right? So a different thing of that is called uh, syn syngamy. Now, syngamy is, basically, syngamy is basically what you guys recognize as the regular uh, reproduction process. And then syngamy is basically when fertilization takes place, all right? Well, for, for fertilization takes place, obviously you have to have gametes that get together. Now, I'm going to talk about that standard version in a second, but before that, I want to talk about the co a little complex version that shows up in a few um, unicellular organisms. Now, notice that you have two different unicellular organisms that will fuse together. And look, they, have, they make gametes based off their nucleuses, so they undergo... Uh, mitosis followed by meiosis creating gametes and then these gametes all right will um, multiply all right and then be exchanged between the two of them randomly and then basically what's happening is that each cell is fertilizing it it's itself and each cell each gamete from one cell is combining with gametes from the other cells forming in both cells a uh, diploid uh, my um, a nucleus. Now this diploid nucleus will then undergo more mitosis, forming several diploid nucleuses. And then these diploid nucleuses will differentiate and keep growing into smaller mini cells within the big cells. Then finally the cells will separate and each of these mini cells will replicate many times in something that saw it looks like um, the schizogony that we saw on the asexual reproduction and form several um, uh, cells out of that. So it's a very complex mechanism of exchanging and uh, cells be uh, and exchanging nucle nuclear information between them. Uh, you create gametes, you multiply the gametes, you exchange the gametes, gametes uh, fertilize it themselves, then you duplicate these, these zygote results inside the cell, let them differentiate, and then you do schizomy, and within each of those things, after they shuffle around, and you make completely different life forms out of the original. So it's a very interesting process of doing that. And then you have the, the, another, the, the standard type of syngamy that everybody recognizes, which is the syngamy of sexual reproduction, right? Now, that's basically when you have... Um, that classic version that we've talked about in the meiosis, when two mature adult organisms both do meiosis of their germ cells to create gametes, which then fuse to, fer fer to fertilization to form a zygote, which is a unicellular diploid cell. And those gametes were haploid cells, of course. And they have to be, otherwise you get double the DNA in the zygote, which is not what you want. And zygote undergo mitosis form... Uh, a multicellular organism which then undergoes differentiation and growth to become the adult which recites which starts the cycle now that is the classic version that everybody recognizes when you think about sexual reproduction but there's actually several versions of these these processes and there's several variations of of these reproductive cycles and so on our next video we're going to talk about some of these variations of the classic reproductive uh, sexual cycle involving meiosis and mit mitosis, which is called alternation of generations. <laughs>